bin cool. Nein. Nein. Testing, one, two, three. Sam? Ja, yeah. hi. Um, sorry, we'll just be a moment. Um, we are still setting up our speakers, but uh, in about a minute or so, we will be starting. Frank, gut, dass du hier bist. Okay, now we are ready. Um, please give a warm hand to Frank and Rob, who will now be talking about telecommunication and networking during energy descent. Good evening. Good evening. Um, there's a Chinese saying, or maybe it isn't a Chinese saying, uh, there's debate on that on the internet. Uh, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and we live in interesting times indeed. Um, you've heard both me and Frank talk about uh, uh, the end of the world in various, uh, in, in various ways. Um, tonight, we hope to go a bit further. Um, first, first uh, uh, let's quickly talk about where we are, which is very depressing. So we'll do that very quickly. And then we'll talk about what will happen next. Um, sort of trying to come, out, come up with scenarios as to what the future will hold um, in this very interesting time. Um, then we're going to be talking about possible responses. We think this community in, particularly, in particular has a role to play in that future. We're going to be talking about possible responses other than denial and panic. Um, and we're going to be focusing towards the second half of this, uh, of this talk at the future of technology and communication. And we're going to be introducing something which we've called transition telecom, uh, which we'll come back to in much more detail. Uh, we're going to be paging through this a little bit quickly because we want to get to the interesting part. Um, first of all, why are all these things happening now? I think one of the most important factors is peak oil. Um, as many of you know and have maybe heard us talk about in, in, uh, in previous congresses or events, um, humanity is now extracting the maximum amount of oil, or was in 2006 extracting the maximum amount of oil. Uh, the oil ascent, the, the, uh, uh, the getting to, to this point, has caused hum human population to explode. That's actually the human population in billions. We're now at seven, and it's 2010, 2011. Um, and so the question is, what will happen next? There's projections. These, this is a whole list of studies uh, as to what will happen. As you can see, the, the dark and light gray area is actual figures. So that's CO is, it's a little bit. Microphone. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm talking away from my microphone. I'm sorry. Um, CO is, stands for conventional oil. Uh, NGPL is non gaseous petroleum liquids. But what it means, what you can see is there's sort of a peak there in the, in the darker gray part that's now been acknowledged as being the global oil peak in 2006. As you can see, most studies, uh, either the ones that see peaking much higher or the ones that see peaking about there, they all project oil exploration to go down more or less rapidly after that. Okay, so the critical point here is oil is not empty then, but there is less and less available. This is the critical point to understand. Um, of course, everybody's talking about renewable energy sources. Um, only a few of the alternative energy sources uh, produce fuel, fuel for transportation, which is usable with the current infrastructure. Um, and the current infrastructure takes about 20 years to replace. Um, and a lot of these do so at the expense of food production. There's a lot of fuel crops on the fields right now. There's rapeseed. There's, uh, 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 there's all sorts of fuel crops. Um, 
There are also soft landing scenarios. People are talking about ways to wane us off this oil addiction and this energy addiction. Um, all of these soft landing scenarios, the realistic ones have in common uh, that they take warlike efforts. They take, they take taking humanity to a whole different mode of, of operating uh, at some point in the past. 1980, 90, uh, would have been excellent times to start doing that. Um, then there's climate change. We've also talked about this in previous occasions. Um, sea level rise. The red line is the sea level rise as predicted by the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, as you can see, there's a range there, and then all the new studies after that project a much higher level of sea level rise. Um, and they're discovering positive feedbacks, new ones all the time. Positive feedbacks as in climate change accelerating itself. Um, here's another interesting slide. It shows, oh, the, the lighter gray has disappeared. Uh, the gray line is from April to, to end of August is the, uh, the ice cover throughout the year. Uh, on the North Pole, and as you can see, the recent years are much below the average, and there's, there's a, a lighter gray area that you don't see on this projector that is two standard deviations away from that, which is actually still quite close to that, uh, to that darker line. Um, climate change uh, is interesting because it's the only problem which may still be around 200 years from now. It's the only problem that can really screw with humanity and humanity's interests in the longer term. Um, then there's problems with the food supply, there's massive soil erosion problems. Uh, fertilizers are generally made, the feedstock for them is natural gas, which has peaked. Um, there's increased competition with fuel crops, uh, people are being priced out of their own food, uh, and there's growing impact of climate change. Um, growth, the fact that, that human activity on the planet keeps growing and that there's a rate of growth that we grow between 3 and 7 percent every year, year on year on year, uh, and that there's interest on interest and exponential growth, that's deeply ingrained in human culture. We've never done anything but grow, at least on average, at least over time when we've done nothing but. Um, but of course, human activity cannot grow forever. Um, even a modest 3.5 percent per year growth means we're doubling every 20 years. Um, there's ecological sources and sinks. The economy, as they say, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the ecology. Meaning, uh, if we pass what ecology can give us in terms of fiber or energy, or, uh, or if we pass what we can get rid of in the ecology uh, in terms of CO2 or, or any of the other waste that comes out of the economy, uh, we surpass the carrying capacity of Earth. Uh, we're now running at 140% of this carrying capacity. Since the, since the 90s, uh, we've passed the carrying capacity of Earth, meaning we're, we're using resources, we're, we're using up the principle of our bank account. We're no longer living off the interest. Um, all of this has been known since 1972, since the, uh, uh, the Club of Rome commissioned the, uh, the Limits to Growth report. All of this has been documented. Uh, uh, they've done every 10-year updates, uh, and this has been largely ignored. Uh, another problem is our present money system. It needs to grow. <laughs> Throughout this period of rapid growth, this, the Industrial Revolution was powered by borrowing from the future. We've borrowed money from tomorrow. We've, we've banked on, our whole banking system works on the fact that tomorrow is bigger than today. Um, now that we meet the growth limits, tomorrow is not going to be bigger than today. It may even be smaller than today, uh, which may not work. Um, which is actually what you can see when you read the news today. Yeah, I mean, we were expecting this to be current. Uh, we were not expecting our talk to be running commentary. Um, this is the US dollar-based money supply. And as you can see, the gray areas are recessions. Um, and as you can see, this recession is kind of special in what happened to the, the amount of money in the economy. Um, a lot of this has effects, as you can see, in the USA, uh, which has the privilege of printing the world's reserve currency. Uh, there's astronomic debt. There's now, they're now printing money like there is no tomorrow, which from their perspective there may not be. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, in Europe, several countries face default, as you all know. There's un unresolved systemic issues. Uh, countries that have different monetary policies and different budgetary authorities sh must share a monetary policy now. Um, and Europe is historically not so nice when countries run out of money. In China, there's the, mo there's the mother of all property bubbles. There's widespread corruption, abuse of power, slavery even, and serious environmental issues. Uh, in summary, uh, your life may be very different very soon. Uh, this is probably not the end of the world. Life will continue, the world will continue, but it is most definitely the end of business as usual. Now, as we said, we ran this very quickly because it's all very depressing and you've heard most of it before, so this is now the official low point indicator slide. Um, the emotional low point... <laughs> Everything until now serves as backdrop for what we're going to do about it. Um, a sense of unease at this point is normal. Uh, it's also possible that you're not worried at all, that you're completely unfazed, unworried. That means you don't understand. Um, okay. Okay, so what we want to talk about now is what things may happen. Um, and we also want to talk about things that may not happen. Uh, there are some things that we can relatively safely exclude because they run against human nature or behavior. Um, and there are also some things um, that may or may not happen based on just what is available on this planet, what works in terms of math and logic and econom uh, economy. Um, there's, of course, the a lot of uh, yeah, thinking that says, yeah, there will be something. There will be some solution. We always found a way out. You know how it is in Star Trek, so there's 30 minutes of doom, and then the last 10 minutes, somebody finds a solution, and a new Bob core somehow magically appears in the sync board. Has been worked before, yeah, that's true. Um, we, the problem is that this, this, the world going into the ship uh, ever deeper, we need more and larger miracles, ever faster. And of course, some of the problems will be mitigated or at least reduced for some time uh, with technology. So one great area of hope is, of course, materials, nanotech. There will be certainly progress. There will be certainly some things that help a little bit. There may be uh, new energy sources. Uh, one of them hotly debated now is Low energy nuclear, uh, nu nuclear reactions, uh, also known as cold fo uh, fusion. And of course, there are quite a number of technologies that may solve problems. Um, sufficiently large number of these miracles could change the game, but only for a while. So there, there is no miracle even on the sci-fi horizon that could change the running out of planet problem. And uh, the question is also, do we really want to bet the farm that one of these technology miracles actually happens on time, delivers as promised, is on budget, on schedule, and, uh, and really does what it should without too many um, yeah, problems? What we currently see is we're having basically uncut denial. So there is very few of the officials acknowledging that peak oil is happening because it would probably confuse the population and make them uneasy and unhappy to acknowledge that we are running out of the stuff that our world is running on. Um, so this is the, the projection of world uh, oil production uh, as viewed by the International Energy Agency. And you see the, the blue curve is what we probably can expect. And then there's a lots of fantasy above it. Uh, and so there, there are, there you see this, this light blue thing this is the, there must be more oil out there. Um, then uh, there's this uh, yellow thing, which is, yeah, we think of something. The, this, nobody believes this. This is the International Energy Agency keeping, yeah. this trying is, to keep the population this, subdued. This is the equivalent of Scotty finding a new warp core under the sink. 
historically, um, end-of-the-world predictions have a lousy track record. So <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, you all know uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that have these uh, bouts of uh, end-of-the-world predictions every now and then. Uh, but uh, human history has a number of interesting lessons. When society in one place round, runs out of the stuff that they need to live. So there are prominent examples, all well documented, for instance, the Maya are getting victim to, uh, victim to climate change and running out of water. There are other societies that basically overextended the land use and collapsed and are just only known to archaeologists when they find the remains. So there is a very, very well-known track record of civilization collapses in mankind's history. Uh, none of these offers us any prediction capability uh, what happens when we run out planet-wide out of stuff. So these are all the isolated incidents like the Mayas and the Uns running out of water or some, uh, some folks in the, in the Turk area running out of water. So things that are localized civilization as a whole sold it on and other places came up, but what happens when the whole planet runs out of the stuff that we need? We can be very sure that whatever is at the end of this journey will redefine us as mankind. So this is the one thing that you can take as truth from all the sci-fi books you read and all the TV series that you have watched, is however we emerge on the other side of, our, of this thing uh, will be as defining as the invention of agriculture or the Industrial Revolution, or even more so. If you look at the uh, impact on society that is ahead of us, is if systems and infrastructures are getting disrupted, and this is what we're talking about here, when we run out of energy, when we run out of planet, uh, the structures that our society is based on will crumble in places. They will not withstand their overuse. And this is doing historically funny things to people's minds. Um, you're having always in these periods large numbers of religious nuts, of people that believe in superstitions, um, and they will gain, gain, gain influence. So if you look at, uh, for instance, what is currently happening in the US with the Tea Party, uh, that's a very clear sign of people who are a little bit different in their head uh, getting to power there. And this will be seen in more places. We also expect that um, because there is a widespread feeling in people who don't know the details, the technical details, that it was technology that ran us all into this deep shit, that there will be anti-science, anti-technology, anti-rational thinking movements, which means that you are all here in the room may be prosecuted one day for knowing too much about technology. This is nothing that is theoretically that may happen. Um, Another thing is some states will run into situations that are basically police states or control states very rapidly because in circumstances that where resources are tight and need to be controlled, uh, those who offer stability or something resembling stability and safety will be very popular. If you're looking at Russia, for instance, the reason why, uh, why Putin is so popular there is because he offered some resemblance of stability after 20 years of raising chaos. But there are also some good things. So some of these uh, today's status symbols uh, may not be so hot <laughs> back then. Um, there's also a little bit of uh, overshot on some areas that, for instance, there's this, this uh, tower in Saudi Arabia that is planned to be built now, which is one kilometer high, and they are, want to start building it this autumn, which may be kind of difficult time to start this. Uh, the whole construction project uh, should be to the tune of $20 billion in pre-crisis terms. I don't know how much it is in after-crisis terms. And uh, we, we projected what happens after the thing uh, uh, is ready built, then this may be the sign that the management posts. So rolling, rolling blackouts in, in vertical may be interesting. We also can see that um, roadside property will be more valuable because there are certain phenomena are not as present as before, like uh, 
yeah, huge traffic jams because we simply cannot afford anymore to have one person in one two and a half ton car driving around. This will not happen anymore. Uh, stuff that is smarter, lighter, more efficient uh, will be more popular, of course. Uh, we see that uh, certainly the flying car may be much more obtainable uh, based on a 100 kilogram vehicle than on a two and a half ton flying thingy. There's, there are huge gains to be made. So we, we're having lots of technology available there. Uh, we have smart sharing of data. We, uh, we may be able to coordinate people's movements more intelligently, and this could save a lot of uh, yeah, waste in, in terms of transportation. So transportation is the one area where we expect things to be not as bad as long as it is on the individual level. Um, but that means we need to, to reduce the average per capita resource use. So how much resources are being used per capita will be the critical factor how much or how good or how bad uh, countries cope with the crisis. Uh, Germany is surprisingly good in that respect. You have to understand that until now, uh, the efficiency, oops, uh, any efficiency gains that we've made have gone into using more, have gone into, uh, uh, now that we have more efficient air conditioners, we leave them on all the time, or we use more air conditioners. So we need energy gains that, that sink the per capita energy use, not just give us more stuff. So th this whole thing will not be in, in step decline as uh, yeah, in the movies, it will be an up and down. So um, those that study the, the peak oil story uh, think that we will see something like a bumpy plateau of growth and uh, shrinking based on how much energy is available. Um, we see that the future markets, which is one of the things why we are in this current financial crisis, price future demand. So future markets are actually accelerating the up and down movements and making them much more bumpy than they needed to be. And so the, the sole commodity market thing will certainly get regulated at some point uh, because we cannot afford to pay more for oil than we actually need to uh, in the very near future. And there will be certainly places and times where everything seems to be fine again. So it's not like we are running now into this deep crisis and will stay there, but it will be something like this. Um, so the black line is um, aggregated the economy growing and shrinking with the oil consumption and the oil price. And whenever the, uh, the economy accelerating hits, the volume of available pumpable oil and gas at this point in time, um, the oil price will explode and the economy will shrink. If you look backwards, what happened to the oil price in the, uh, before the financial crisis <coughs> 2008 triggered, you will see that there was a massive peak in oil price that then was one of the contributing factors to the uh, triggering of the financial crisis. And uh, when, <laughs> when, that, I'm sorry. when that happens, then um, the oil price will shrink, the economy will, will shrink, uh, causing the oil price to fall. And in these periods of time, things are, that are conserving energy may not be as important. And, but as soon as the economy picks up again, the oil price picks up again with it, then we will see uh, yeah, much more energy efficient priorities. The interesting thing here is that the, the red line is basically the global output. So unless some miracle happens in terms of energy use, uh, we will see an in total shrinking economy. So what, will, what does it mean in, in practical terms? What will actually be the everyday impact of that. One thing will be that we, since fuel and transportation costs, especially for the long range, uh, will increase, uh, deglobalization and relocalization of economy will probably happen. Um, it will no longer be irrelevant if you're having cheap shit from China because the transport cost share of that thing may be too high or you may not even get it. There will be fewer global markets, so the, this whole globaliz globalization thing where you can actually uh, ship shrink, uh, shrimps, 
to Morocco to get peeled and frozen and then back to Europe, this will probably no longer happen. So things will be done more locally, which also means that there will be more jobs locally, which is an interesting result. Uh, there will, of course, be economic protectionism. Um, first national, of course, maybe regional could happen. So you can only buy food from here. Would be an interesting concept. And there will be more localized economic activity. And things will slow down considerably. We uh, could see that in the last economic crisis, two years ago, or three years ago, um, what happened there was that a lot of the container ships were actually driving slower. So they were just basically halving the transportation speed and reducing the oil consumption by at least one third. So if you drive a ship slower, then it needs more uh, less energy. For instance, if you're flying in, in low price airline these days, you may notice that you need on average a couple of hours longer on them than on if you're flying, flying premium full price airlines because they just fly, uh, fly slower. If you're going with your plane 700 kilometers per hour, it eats much less uh, fuel than if you're running at, at 930. One of the things that we will notice is that complexity is the enemy. Uh, the, the current system with everything, with the logistics, with how we get the stuff that we eat, uh, how the networks function, is all present on complex systems that are built on top of other complex systems. If you want to reboot everything from scratch, like for instance, when you look at, uh, at certain disaster areas where the whole infrastructure needs to be completely rebooted, like for instance in Japan, you see what, what a massive effort that is and how long it takes and how much money needs to be poured in. And these are very local things. So if the systems start to crumble at some point locally, there may be areas where it's not really worth or possible to reboot things to, to the present state. One of the reasons for that is that all resilience has been optimized out of systems. So if you're looking at transportation systems, at logistics, at production systems, at the whole just-in-time production, uh, basically on everything that is our modern economy, everything that is fed has been optimized out. There is no storage anymore. So if you look at the, your typical supermarket, um, in, in Germany it's a little bit better than in the Netherlands, but in the Netherlands there is only for one day storage in the supermarket. And there may be storage of goods for another three days in a large storage facility at the city corner, but it's not like the supermarket has like, like your average corner store in a village and supply of a week or two uh, of non-perishable goods sitting around, but it's one or two days. You notice that, for instance, when in, <clears throat> in winter, when the transportation system partially collapses because there's too much snow, then you suddenly see certain goods vanishing from the supermarket shelves because they cannot be refilled fast enough, which is what usually happens every night that you're refilling the supermarkets. And so these, this, this just-in-time ideology, this, this optimizing out uh, in, in terms of cost efficiency is costing us resilience. So our systems are not very stable against disruptions of any kind, which is, of course, triggered by... Yeah, capital efficiency. If you don't have that, stu that much stuff laying around, it doesn't cut, uh, cost capital. Things may change. Um, this is causing, of course, an increasing rate of disruptions. So when, whenever something starts to fail in one corner, it may trigger failures in other corners. And so the, we need systems that are distributed, self-reliant, less complex, and that are kind of more stable under more adverse circumstances. This is something that is a completely new path of development for all kinds of systems that we are currently building, be it logistics or technology. So if we want to survive as a species, we will need to put in efforts much less like during a war, where everything is concentrated by order the mufti or by uh, yeah, will of the people onto, onto one thing and uh, this may be then just survival and uh, in the long run this may have huge benefits so we will in the end emerge as an humanity that is much more stable against all kinds of disruptions being it asteroid impacts or 
whatever happens to us. Um, and the good thing is um, we don't have to kill each other like in a war. Uh, we could basically have an enemy that uh, uh, is just uh, not an enemy but a goal for our survival. And these, these things are a chance. They are not just bad, but things that uh, could be fun. Yeah, one of the things we need to start doing is rethinking wealth. Uh, this is a, uh, a Mercedes that's covered in gold and diamonds. Um, and we need to also rethink happiness. Oops, there's feedback. Uh, studies show that as soon as we're out of poverty, uh, how happy we are as humans does not increase by how wealthy we are, as long as we're out of poverty. Uh, it does, however, make us happier if we're just a little bit happier than the people next to us, the people close to us. Um, and historically, from, from very simple villages onwards where stones or other possessions were used, we use possessions to indicate social status, and that is a problem. That is a trap that's currently engulfing humanity. Um, what we need to be moving towards, and what we will move towards, I'm convinced, is a steady state or non-growth economy. There's a lot of interesting reading on that, um, because simply we cannot double our economic activity. There, there's just no way. So whether we get there by by rising, crashing, rising, crashing, and sort of sort of finding our way there, or whether we find some more intelligent way to get there, that's where we'll end up. I'm I'm convinced. Um, what that means is it'll become increasingly clear that the creation of new wealth, which has been the present trick to get people out of poverty, uh, the creation of new wealth is not going to help get significant new people out of poverty, uh, which means wealth distribution issues will be addressed one way or another. Um, now we get to what I think is, is, is an interesting bit. Um, in England, but also in other countries, there's something called the transition movement, and they're setting up groups that call themselves transition towns, and they're relocalization efforts. Mostly, as I said, on the town level, England has a very uh, uh, non-suburbanized countryside. It has compact towns and then little villages outside of the towns. But lots of, lots of people on the English countryside live in towns between, between say, five and, and 20,000 people. Um, it started in the UK, there's lots of other countries. Um, it's engaging people in their communities, uh, and it generally results in more fulfilling lives. It means people are having fun doing this, uh, which I think is very important. Some of the ideas behind this movement is to see, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, what am I doing? Forward, uh, forward. Yeah. What did I do? Um, one of the things they, they stress and hammer in is to see opportunities more than threats. Um, one of the terms they handle a lot is energy descent, is coming down off that hill of using way too much energy per capita, assuming that that amount of energy per capita is not going to be available in the future, and finding some smart way of, of lowering the per capita energy use. Shortening the feedback loops, which is their term for making sure that the local farmer, the local baker, the local grain mill uh, don't all either export or import from a thousand kilometers away, but somehow connect to each other. In other words, shorten the loops that, for instance, food supply or other things need to, need to be making to get to the people, to get to, to, you, to the usable state. Um, these are people, uh, groups of people thinking very hard about how, they're, how to make their communities resilient trying to think about what happens if certain features or certain services disappear. Um, there's lots of people thinking about something called permaculture, which I, th I don't know all that much about, but I think is fascinating. It's the idea that uh, you grow crops uh, uh, that are, it's the opposite of monoculture. It's growing little bits of crops, all different kinds, fitting together in nature so that nature helps you deal with the pests and you don't, you're not fighting nature, but you're working with nature. Uh, also, lots of people are thinking about the local economy, and are, there's local, local currencies being passed out in some towns, which are exchangeable to the, to the outside currency. But they're trying to keep money in the loop as well as goods into the loop. So Bitcoin, I guess, is, is, is one of our answers. 
Not, um, not in terms of energy use? Not in terms of energy use, no. <laughs> true, true. Um, and I guess one of the things we're trying to do is to present this new term of transition telecom, which is, it's nice that all these people are thinking about the food supply and about how to get to this world where we use less energy per capita, but it would be nice if there was networking and telecommunications in that world, but we can't assume that there's endless growth and we can't assume that it's going to be a little bit rough. Um, let's look at present day expectations for technology. Of course, there's, the worst one is Moore's Law. Everything will double all the time. Everything will get bigger. Um, there's a continuous new stream of stuff from China where we, we're going to get by uh, more pixels, more processing power next year than we do this year. Everything will move to the cloud, uh, more data centers, um, all centralized, more globalized. Uh, uh, the local will disappear, um, which are all trends which are visibly past their peak in a lot of other fields. Um, this is a Cisco ad. Um, I hope you can read it. Yeah, it's fairly readable. Um, this is, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, this is a Cisco ad, uh, and it's, as you can see, it says, uh, 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 planetary skin will use billions of network sensors. We have cameras in, in, in cubic millimeters, 150 of them in this icon. Uh, with the IPv6 protocol, we'll have so many addresses. That's 100 for every atom on the face of the Earth. And then at the end, it says, the only limitation left will be your own imaginations. And I go, seriously? There's a lot of binary thinking happening about this future that we're headed towards. Um, people think that it's either the future will have everything we have today or maybe more. There's going to be incremental changes. So we don't need to think much about it. It's just going to happen. Or they think uh, no electricity, blood in the streets, everything lost, subsistence farming. Uh, we must get guns and ammo. Uh, so there's no need to think about technology because that's all past and we need to... Um, and in reality, I think there's this gray area in between. And this gray area is where we're probably going to be ending up. That's the area of the highest probability. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are having a, a number of different scenarios that, that will basically drive the, uh, the next slides uh, talking about. And uh, basically, this is the severity of the problem. And they may be very uneven. And they may be uneven in time, there may be areas where the problems do not occur for the next five years or ten years. There may be areas where they are cropping up tomorrow. So you should always remember that uh, it took Rome 350 years to finally collapse completely, and also our civilization will be relatively slow in collapsing in overall, which doesn't mean that it will not be quite unpleasant in some places. So what is very likely is that we will get into periods of slower or no economic growth, um, where economy will be relatively uh, unpleasant. There's uh, not many jobs uh, where companies fall and fail. There will be only an iPhone every new year, three years, not every year, new one. And stuff will not be as disposable as it is today. This is kind of scenario that everybody can basically imagine and doesn't have many problems with. But it could be, at least in places, much worse. So there, there could be frequent disruptions of various kinds. Um, the, the fuel price is triggering lots of unpleasant surprises. And in the end, more radical changes that are also prominent and not just temporary. And which also means that this is the, the moment where more, lo more localization happens. And, but this could go on further, this, uh, up until collapse of centralized infrastructures. Uh, essential supplies, for, uh, for instance, medical supplies, may not be available. If you look at what, what happens uh, after the tsunami and the uh, disaster, uh, nuclear disaster in Japan, there were quite a number of companies that suddenly figured out that they were entirely dependent on one tiny part or one tiny molecule that is exclusively manufactured on the wrong coast of Japan. And they were not getting it anymore, and they needed to somehow find things and get it back to working, and stuff was not available, phones were not built, uh, because some kind of special rubber was not available that seals the display, stuff like that. 
And this may, may lead up to that in certain areas, parts of the infrastructure may be abandoned. So there, there may be disaster so zones that where there is no infrastructure anymore, and there will be no infrastructure anymore if not somebody builds it. This may even lead to yeah, longer widespread disruptions, and uh, this is then how this looks like. So the interesting question then is, how do we keep this stuff running? Uh, which um, is kind of important. So we are having, if you look at how much systems are currently running on internet, are on GPS, on GSM, on 3G, uh, this is, uh, would be very, very unpleasant if the, the, when the core network goes down, when the communication services are no longer available, there will be lots of other systems that will immediately fail. Um, we know that much of the stuff that we're currently running is bad by design, that it uh, is not really as we would like to have it. So there's lots of community standards, especially in telecommunications. There's lots of bad software around. There are many designs uh, that you wouldn't really want to run on the long run if you could, but um, the, the problem is we have no, not many alternatives on that. And the, the main problem is do we trust the people that we know, these IT integrators and uh, the systems of this world uh, to keep that stuff running if the shit hits the fan. So, and uh, yeah, yeah, probably not. And so, but, but who should it be doing? Yeah, and uh, there was this uh, XKCD strip that you may know or not. And this will be probably what it comes down to. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, if you're thinking about resilience uh, and sustainability, uh, there are two different things. Uh, something can be not very sustainable, like a tank full of diesel in a generator. They're not sustainable at all. They're just as unsustainable as the present system. But they give you time to think. If you have power that lasts you a year, independent of everything else, you have a year to figure out what the new situation is. Um, and given how critical some of the infrastructure that's running today is, and some of the infrastructure that's under our care, if you are a sysadmin today, or if you're working at a telco today, and some of the infrastructure that will either be abandoned or that will have to be built, and that will end up under our care because nobody understands how it works anymore or because it's been built by morons and it has to be first reverse engineered. Um, my, my general feeling is we need to worry about resilience first. That said, uh, any new infrastructure that we eventually come up with better be better on the earth, better be uh, more energy efficient and less polluting than what we have today. Um, a few thoughts which are all fairly obvious, so I'm just going to race through them. Uh, if you're running stuff, if you're, if you're operating routers, uh, or systems, or, or, or uh, uh, keeping stuff running in, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, print notes so they're on paper. Don't have them on a wiki somewhere else, or, or on in the cloud in a in a, in a uh, document on Google Docs. Um, uh, print everything one would, could possibly need to keep something running. Uh, include your contact details with the street address, not just your Gmail address. Uh, keep old stuff around. Hide it if you have to. Uh, have a config that works if lots of other things don't work. So take out all the, have a configuration for your stuff that doesn't need GPS to provide time or that doesn't need GSM to be around to provide the go ahead. Uh, I think there was a funny story where uh, wind farms in Germany uh, don't go on unless they're told over GSM to go on and they go off automatically if GSM disappears. Uh, which makes sense from some perspectives, but isn't good. Then if you have that configuration, test it. Uh, make sure that it actually works, because you're not going to have time to test it when stuff hits the fan. Um, if you're designing stuff, all of this is also very obvious. The software, equipment, or network that you're designing should conserve energy, not have unnecessary dependencies, do something smart if there's a disruption of any of the dependencies or semi-dependencies. Um, it should work with minimal hardware. Uh, 
Don't design stuff to only work if it has uh, three quad cores, uh, whatever. Uh, make sure your stuff works on, sm on smaller configurations. Uh, whatever you build should not need rocket scientists to be able to run. If you can make it mesh, uh, if you can make it not need infrastructure at all, so much the better. It should be easy to fix and it should be well documented. All of this is obvious, but it should still be said. If you're designing stuff, design stuff for a future which may well be different. Um, now, nobody really has an economic impetus. At this point, none of the existing players in the market has an economic impetus to make all this happen. Nobody is looking at resilience of the infrastructure and says, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put money in, which means we'll have to steal time and steal resources and build resilience as a conspiracy. Uh, I, I wrote a little text here uh, from the early 2010s onward, an ad hoc global conspiracy of elite programmers, engineers, and sysadmins had taken it upon themselves to make systems and networks more resilient, whether their bosses wanted to or not. Um, there's stories like the, the, the way the, uh, the Apple II had its memory expandability. Uh, uh, Jobs didn't want that in, and Wozniak put it in anyway, uh, hid the pads on the board so that people could solder that on, which eventually saved the company. Mm. And uh, there are other stories like uh, here around the corner and uh, there's a small village and, uh, at the river uh, and that used to have floods every 20 years. And uh, after the war came down, the, the local fire brigade got new water pumps and new equipment and they had this humongous pump sitting there, uh, which they at some point got from the, I think from the Soviet army. And at some point they wanted, <laughs> wanted to throw it away uh, because there was, yeah, it was taking up the space and they would, wanted to put their barbecue there. And uh, so it should be scrapped. And then the old fire brigade chief took the thing and put it on his backyard. And then in uh, 2004 or 2005, when the big, big, big flood, the biggest ever came there, uh, It turned out that he had kept the thing in perfect shape and condition all the time. And it was that pump from the backyard that actually saved the village when the, the dike burst. And so this is what we're talking about. Basically, keep capabilities around that are there. Make sure that, that uh, stuff that offers you capabilities is not thrown away because you need more space for the barbecue. Um, there's a concept that some of you may be familiar with, uh, uh, the big box stores, uh, uh, the larger stores outside the village that uh, are part of a large national chain, sell stuff for cheaper than the local, uh, than the local uh, uh, salespeople can or the local companies can. Um, and local economies are damaged significantly from, from these large corporations uh, uh, coming up on the edge of town and, and selling stuff for cheap, ex essentially forcing the people in that village to work in, in, in lower and lower and more menial jobs. Uh, because all the local economy is slowly disappearing. Um, I'd like to make the point that cloud services are doing the same thing to the net. Uh, we're losing more and more capabilities. Uh, the present iteration of the internet revolution is not spinning off anything that you can decentrally run. Before, we had all these interesting open source projects. We had uh, uh, Apache, uh, Linux itself, Apache, uh, all these projects were meant for bigger players or, or were written by bigger players or with support by of bigger players, but they were also usable on a decentral level. You could run your own installation and, and have your own, whatever, WordPress, have your own. All this software was usable on the decentral level. With the cloud, we're sort of pulling back that whole level of services. Nobody can run their own mail server anymore. Nobody can run their own. All of that is being pulled back into a smaller number of, 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 of cloud service providers. And all we're left with is people that can hook up the, 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 the DSLAMs or the Cisco boxes or the cable routers. And then from there on out, we're supposed to be using the services that we can't duplicate. Um, all of that is paid for with consumer spending, meaning advertising in many cases, say the, the Google business model, uh, which only works if people spend. When, there, when advertising is no longer a workable model, when markets are no longer as global, Uh, how do we know that the cloud survives? And then also, 
cloud services are concentrated in the U.S., which uh, at the very least is not going to have the, the least problems uh, uh, in the coming time. Uh, so this is something we really need to think about. Yeah, so, so what is needed and what, what do we... Uh, that what do we need to build? What need we, do we need to focus on? Um, one thing, as Rob said, is certainly infrastructure systems that can be run locally. So the, the mail server, the Java server, um, the things that we still are used to run on our own servers that are not yet run on the cloud and that may offer a little bit less reliability than Google Mail, but at least you know where your data is and you know where a server is and you know how to get it back running if something fails. And another very important thing is the tools for freedom. We, as I said, we are running into times where police state may be a very interesting option for many politicians. And this may, may be a very pleasant police state, one that is very unobtrusive, but that just doesn't a user-friendly police state, uh, one that, that only bothers you if you're really a threat to the system. But Given that, um, activists will need tools for communication, and, and the activists may as well be us. So we will need still tools that we can uh, yeah, work for political change in one, one uh, or the other direction and still communicate, still publish stuff, still leak stuff, and make sure that we are not, not getting caught in the process. And so there, there is a number of tools that we already have, but they need to be kept running, like Tor, like I2P, uh, like secure mail and chat and collaboration tools, even more important, more and more um, stuff that allows you to, to edit uh, on your own server with multiple users. And we need to make these tools hardened against the packet inspection because the packet inspection is the one tool that the future police state will really, really love. And the, the thing is that the, there will be no future Twitter revolutions, so this was a one-off thing. We can be pretty sure about it, that uh, making a revolution with the current open social media tools was one thing that caught them by surprise once, but it even doesn't, didn't work uh, one country further apart. Uh, so the future Twitter revolutionary will be recognized by the, by the bullet hole. Yeah, so what is self-reliance? So how do we define that? So we, first we need to define self. So what, what is us? So of course you can build everything yourself, like your small digital house in the mountains, like Fefe does only his own software. Um, <laughs> but uh, essentially there, there is no, no security without community. So we need to define self as um, a community of people that you can trust and that, uh, whose work you can rely on. There is the theory that the bigger the trouble, the smaller the group. Um, there are other theories that say, okay, a completely self-reliant economy, localized economy needs about 6,000 people. Uh, we yet have to come up uh, with metrics uh, on how many people we need for digital economies that are uh, self-reliant or di digital uh, yeah, structures. And but one thing that we can truly sure about, communi communities that have still working telecommunication services will be stronger than those that have not. Uh, we don't need to tell you, we have this here. So we, we have the main stuff here. We have our, our, our POC, we have our NOx, we have our ONGSN networks. Things like this are becoming very, very important. So we are at a point where we are quite lucky that we already have lots of things because we meet every two years to camp out on some campground and still want to have our internet. So this is a good thing. Um, yeah, this will be needed to spread out. Another thing is information. Uh, lots of our stuff, lots of what we know as a society is now digitized and is sitting on some fucking data centers where we even don't know where they are. And the, those can actually disappear. And <laughs> there, I don't know how, how many of you are already managing most parts of their lives based on how to videos downloaded from YouTube. Uh, huh? Yeah, but you, even those are using their 
the YouTube videos to, uh, to bake a cake or bread. So, and if, if this this is no longer there, what do we do? Uh, so, also parts of documentation uh, that you rely on may no longer be available. So the the information that we rely on to manage our lives and to do stuff and to invent stuff is quite often not on our computers. This needs to be changed. Uh, also infrastructure documentation, especially where the fibers come up and, and that kind of stuff, is most of part not really in our possession. So we need local storage. We need to share this information. So just download what you find important, store on your local disk, share with your friends. That's extremely important. Another thing is uh, building resources. So saving usable gear is in a very interesting hobby. Some of us are already in it when I'm looking around uh, in the tents here. Then uh, save stuff before the lower entropy crowds get it. You know these, uh, the people that are stealing copper wires in the night, sometimes while they are under power. Uh, but you should discriminate and only save the stuff that is really worth running more than it's worth in copper. Uh, so we should have shopping lists for when the time hits the fan, uh, cell sites, servers, routers, everything that we need to keep stuff running. Reusing, recycling, component level repair, and very important, uh, only keep stuff that you have the parts and tools to keep running. Basically match your tools and what you, what you keep in, in terms of tools to the things that you, that you own. And the question is, to what then? So um, certainly it will be a very long time before uh, yeah, pigeons or mail delivery is the fastest tr tr form of data transport. So this will be quite a bit. But there is no stable pre-industrial state to fail back to uh, when the telecommunication uh, is not no longer there. So we don't have an option to not keep telecommunications running. Um, so we need to invent new stuff, not fall back to old stuff. This is very different from many other aspects, for instance, from agriculture, where there is a sort of stable fallback or several stable fallback uh, things. Uh, we are overtiming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so relax, we're overtiming. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Uh, we need to do what just works. There's no, no, no other option than that. So this may be, may be the future, uh, getting back to, to water pumps, basically, to, to infrastructure hotspots where services are available, where, where when the long-distance network fails, uh, there's like internet cafes in the desert or spots where there is still telecommunication services when the DSL, DSLMs are no longer operated because they are no longer profitable. If you look at how thin the operation margins of most ISPs are, then that consumer internet may no longer be profitable is not an unrealistic scenario in dire economic times. And so there's always patterns like the core shops, you know, that in most uh, cities are run by immigrant communities that want to phone home. They are already, already running this kind of model. So when where they found out that if they centralize telephone service, they could make a cheaper point so people are coming there to make their phone calls and get, get their internet access and whatever. And there, these can, of course, then be the nucleuses for some sort of new uh, internet that spreads out again. So if we have local infrastructure breakdowns, there may be need for complete bootstrapping. Fortunately, we have the technology. Uh, we have M Radio digitized, meanwhile, very interesting stuff. So you can do fascinating data transmission even over long range, over shortwave. This is just maybe enough for chat and mail, but not for porn downloading, unfortunately. Um, so, but uh, we have, uh, for shorter range, we have uh, the, the Fryphone communities and uh, other stuff that makes it available for mesh networking to become the dominant service. So currently, you have the situation that these services are competing with working DSL service. So there is no real need to climb to your roof to put up the, uh, a dish or an antenna to link up to the next Trifum node because uh, yeah, you have your DSL working at home. 
Uh, but in circumstances where you don't have this, like we had, for instance, in East Berlin and certain areas where we didn't have DSL, yeah, we were just climbing to our roofs and we're setting up these things. So that means as long as the technology is there, it will be very quick that these networks spring up again and, and get, uh, get operational. That said, these technologies need serious work, for instance, auto meshing and making sure that the routers find each other and um, yeah, uh, can add new links very quickly is something that, that really needs work. So if you want to do something today, then go out and make sure that this uh, open WRT and Trifron stuff and the mesh networking stuff is getting substantially better and substantially better working and more reliable. So there's, there's one, one interesting thing in circumstances where resources are not really a plenty, especially in terms of bandwidth, we need to think about what to do. So how to, what services prioritize and what things we really want to have and where we can, yeah, what we can uh, leave out. And interestingly, the technology that is currently used to attack network neutrality, meaning prioritization of services, is something that we will need then. So if you're getting asked by your boss uh, to learn about these, these new traffic shapers, then by all means learn about it. Uh, we may need them later. Okay. Um, so yeah, decentralization and stuff that uh, doesn't require centralized infrastructure is really important, but that's kind of, yeah. One thing that's not really obvious is um, your friends whom you're hanging out with when the shit hits the fan, I mean the real ones, the ones that, that you are actually knowing and know that you can work with, are, are much more important than your toys. Uh, so it's the people that you know and the people that, you, that know you and that you can trust uh, that you will need to cope with. And uh, so working on these personal relationships is something of the best preparation you can do. Uh, so you should think about when things are really getting nasty, who are the people you want to work with. And these may not be the people that you're going in the evening to drink with, but maybe the people that you know that you at least can do software work together or hardware work or uh, that you at least know that, that they are reliable. So, um, what to do now? First, um, we need to analyze what we depend on and how it will fail, uh, which offers surprising insights. So you will find out things if you look into, into deeply, like for instance, how even your mail is getting delivered, how many digital systems are already involved, and in I mean physical mail, so the, the snare mail, or what is needed to get your pizza to you delivered, uh, it's surprisingly complex, and you should learn about what is actually happening there and how it fails. You should join the resilience conspiracy, um, make sure that the stuff that you're running is more resilient than your boss expects uh, for the time when you need to fire your boss and run the stuff, which will at some point come. Start to develop the plans for afterwards. Obtain the information about the infrastructure that you depend on. This is ironically uh, becoming very hard because infrastructure information is considered terrorism relevant uh, in more and more places. So obtaining the information that you need to survive uh, may get you into trouble today. So be careful of that. Yeah, storing things locally. So if you have two terabyte of pawns, then at least you should have two terabyte of manuals next to it is something that uh, will make you very popular in a few years time when you still have these old blueprints around. Document your stuff. When you're buying stuff, when you're thinking, okay, I need to spend uh, something interesting now, uh, I have 500 euros that uh, I don't need anymore at the moment, then don't buy the plasma TV. Buy something that you can actually do something useful with. Prefer tools over toys and prefer stuff that you or your friends can repair. So if you're buying a new shiny bicycle that contains too many parts that you don't even know the names of, then you apparently bought the wrong bicycle. And uh, last but not least, uh, this is basically building a new world. You can think of it like uh, colonizing a new planet. And this is what we always wanted to do, even if the planet is our old planet, but it's something where we need to put a lot of work in. Yeah. <laughs> Do 
we have time for a few questions? Um, yeah. Hi. Hello. May I? Yeah. Um, I'm now ignoring the printed schedule because we have about 25 minutes to, until the next talk, so we can spend at least 10 minutes for questions, I hope. There's the first one. Please use microphones for the questions. Um, yeah, Constanza was first. <coughs> I just have a short remark to my regret. I guess that some factor is missing in that equation and it changes the equation. I guess uh, that we have to look at um, decades of um, declining oil resources and that means that we will have wars over its possession. Sorry and we, we, we should have that into our equations. We cannot hear a word. So can you, can you repeat there was nothing understandable? Okay. I will repeat it. Um, I think we should acknowledge that there is a factor missing in this equation and this is the war over the possession of that oil and that would change all of the thinking about it. Oh, there's, there's definitely the potential for all sorts of, 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 of dystopian futures, even very close. There's going to be war over oil, there's going to be wars over water, uh, uh, there's going to be wars fought over a lot of resources in a lot of different places. Um, it's just that I, we, both the two of us have been confused about, uh, have been accused of being dystopian and negative and, and, and always coming up with the negative story. So now we finally wanted to bring this positive story about how we were going to bring, go into this bright future uh, after the collapse. And now you're saying that we're not negative enough. We cannot do it right, can we? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Just shout it. It's going to be easier if you just shout it. Please speak into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm with an organization named the, the Free Network Foundation. And we're working with different groups like uh, Freedom Box or, or Byzantium from, from, from Hack DC and, and uh, other distributed networking groups. And our goal is to, to steward the emergence of a uh, global federation of, of mesh networks uh, that's owned and operated by, by the people that use it collectively. So my question is, do you know about those projects? What do you think of them, particularly Freedom Box? And what would you say uh, to the thought that uh, global uprising or revolution or resistance will be concomitant with the emergence of uh, a civil network that, that we all own and operate? Um, we, we know about a lot of these projects and one of the purposes of this talk is uh, to, to focus attention on them. So if you could just say, I think you have a village uh, uh, here on camp, right? There, uh, there are several villages for, from people who are doing mesh technology, so doing uh, these, these kinds of things, federation of uh, independent ISPs and things like that. And so there's a lot of stuff that you can actually learn here on camp about that. Um, and so if you stick around or say it, in what area we can find, people can find you, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, I'll also say that at 9 o'clock after this, there on uh, HXX Radio, there's going to be an hour-long program about decentralized networks if people are interested. Okay, you, know, so you know what? Give me a URL, then I'll stick it in the slides and people can read it later. What's okay. the URL for your project? Uh, the, uh, the FNF.org or freenetworkfoundation.org. Freenetworkfoundation.org. Thanks. Freenetworkfoundation.org. See, you're now in the list of links officially. Yeah, that's a good. Um, so we have most of the, of the needed technology covered on this Congress we have and, and camp. We have uh, mesh networks, we have GSM. But uh, what we don't have is power generation. And I, I was uh, proposing for the next camp we should have uh, open source windmills and solar panels and whatnot. So we need to spend more time researching that now than researching more GSM maybe. Yeah, I've, I've, long wondered, <laughs> I've, I've long wondered if we could do a hacker conference that generates its own energy sustainably uh, and how that would change the hacker conference. Uh, uh, I think it would be a very interesting experiment. We could start it as a village and see if we can grow it out from there. It would, it would be fascinating. So we, we're currently using here peak power around uh, 220 kilowatts uh, at this camp. So this is a, what we're currently using. 
And uh, I think this is approximately what is coming out of, uh, of the solar field that we have there if the sun is shining. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so there, there are some challenges ahead. And especially use, how to use power that is intermittently available it will be something interesting. So, Jake. One, one thought is um, the Engineers Without Borders group. They have this really fantastic uh, set of things that they do. Like they'll go to Guatemala, they'll take a water barrel and cut it in half, stick a pole in the middle, and put a bicycle chain, some magnets, and some copper. And when the wind blows, they've made their own generator. And the total cost of this is only local parts except the magnets, because it's more expensive to make the magnets than to buy them, even in Guatemala. Uh, and then they have you know, the ability to generate this power, but not to store it. But it strikes me that the accumulators from some of the satellite talks they're trying to solve the same problem, but in space, of accumulating power. So building accumulators would be good. Um, mm -hmm. what, the, the question I have for you is, the Tor project is building um, this thing, the Tor router, which is going to be like a, a little box with Wi-Fi in it. And we'd like to be able to add a mesh option to it. But there are like a bunch of different people that are arguing that their mesh is the best. And so the question that I have is, if, since I'm going to put the mesh option into the Tor router, if someone here has an idea about how we can best interface with things that already exist to, to have this anonymity network built in, if you have some suggestions about that. Could, uh, could all the mesh people get together with Jake and fight it out over which mesh he includes in his Tor router? Yeah. <laughs> Bring. OK, so the, 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 final, the final mesh fight will be tomorrow when there's enough mud outside. So we will do a mesh mud yeah. fight. Okay, we even have some questions from uh, Twitter and uh, from IRC. Um, first, um, Bona Fiscalia will thank uh, Frank for the book tip on Suarez. On what? Uh, the book tip from Suar Suarez. Uh, Daniel Suarez. Yeah, the, uh, actually, uh, one of my favorite authors um, there uh, has written two sci-fi novels. Uh, Daniel Suarez is the name. You can look it up. And uh, he has uh, put a lot of uh, thinking into how yeah, meshed communities after the collapse can work and uh, what is required to make them working. Uh, and it's a very entertainable um, yeah, sci-fi read, so that uh, that's certainly worth reading. Okay, and the second comment is about um, how do you think will coal to oil liquefi liquefi liquefaction affect peak oil? Sorry, how will what? Um, yeah, the, the question is what, uh, coal, coal liquefaction and, and our other uh, new energy sources. Uh, this is basically in, the, in this little graph that we had of the uh, International Energy Organization, the, the yellow part on the up, uh, upper side, unconventional energy sources. And they have one common characteristic, and that is that they have a very low netto output of energy. Uh, if you liquefy coal to make it uh, into fuel, then you're wasting a lot of energy on making it liquid. Uh, and in the end, you're also wasting huge scraps of landscape to, to get the coal out of the ground. Um, so yes, this will be done uh, as oil gas is getting more expensive, but it won't solve the, uh, solve the problem. Uh, oh, there's one question left. I think that's the last one. Um, so one thing, you're arguing that simplicity is better than complexity. You're arguing that simplicity is better than complexity, right? After the collapse. Um, and that economy is going to be relocalized. Um, point is, so if we do that, then if the economy is more localized, then a lot of people will spend more time actually growing food, which takes a lot of time when you we do cannot, that. We cannot understand a single word of what you're saying. We, we pick up a word here and there. Okay, then we'll talk about that later and okay. Should we it. take this off? Okay. Yeah, we, we don't have any time left now, really, for this, this time for real. So please give a very a warm applause to our speakers.